Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Julie Cusick and I'm the Communications and Engagement Coordinator for West Central Airshed and Alberta Capital Airshed. Thank you for attending our second Clean Air webinar for 2022. This webinar is called Alberta's Air Monitoring Plan, the next five years. The Clean Air webinar series are put on jointly by West Central Airshed Society and Alberta Capital Airshed. The name Clean Air Webinar Series is a nod to the pre-pandemic conferences that we used to hold in person um, that were called the Clean Air Forum. So this webinar series is one way of continuing to build that knowledge and momentum around air quality monitoring in the region, while potentially even reaching wider audiences because we now know how to do Zoom and all of these things online that we didn't know how to do as well before. You can follow along for updates on future webinars via our website at capitalairshed.ca or wcas.ca. You can also give us a little follow on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, as well as signing up for our monthly newsletters. I'd also like to acknowledge those working behind the scenes to put on today's webinar. Um, Gary Redman, the Executive Director for Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed, who's actually presenting at another webinar um, later today, but um, is very supportive of the webinar series. Russ Miyagawa on technical support and Serena Tang, who will be putting out some fantastic post webinar social media content that you can uh, watch out for. So for today's webinar series on Alberta's five year monitoring plan, we have two speakers, Bob Myrick, Director of Airshed Science with Alberta Environment and Parks, give a little wave. Yay, okay, thanks. And then we have Dr. Kevin McCullum, the data scientist for WestCast and ACA. Welcome both. So a bit of housekeeping on how this hour will go. Bob and Kevin will each give a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Then we'll have questions from all of you webinar participants and questions are welcome and encouraged. When you do this, please use the Q&A function, not the comment box. That makes it easier for me to facilitate and make sure that the questions that you've asked get um, answered. Also, there are no bad questions. We have participants joining us from a variety of backgrounds, and we all come at this with a different level of background knowledge. So ask away. The last piece is I would also like to advise you that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared to both the Alberta Capital Airshed website and the West Central uh, website as well. So with that, let's get started. Bob Myrick is the Director of Airshed Sciences for the Airshed and Watershed Stewardship Branch of Alberta Environment and Parks. Bob has worked for the past 32 years for Alberta Environment and Parks and has contributed to establishing airsheds in the province, conducting evaluation and reporting for air data and participating on numerous CASA project teams in developing policy advice for government. Bob led the development of the Alberta Air Data Warehouse and Alberta's Air Quality Health Index System. You've probably heard of that Alberta Air Quality Health Index System. So this is exciting to have Bob here today. In recent years, Bob has been involved in leading and advising on the air and deposition components of the oil sands monitoring program. So in his presentation, Bob will provide an overview of the provincial five-year quali air quality monitoring plan, also known as MERV. What are the gaps in air quality monitoring in Alberta? What areas are most in need of air quality monitoring? What types of parameters or pollutants are of interest? Why do these gaps even matter? And how is the province working in partnership with airsheds to fill those gaps? So with that, welcome Bob, and thank you for coming today. Thanks so much, and uh, I'm glad to be here today. I'm just going to start uh, sharing my screen. Let's just see if I can successfully do that. You should have it coming up any second. There okay. we go. We can see it great. Sounds good. I was going, looks, well, I was planning to, oh, I was going to shut off my camera just for now, just for the presentation part of it, so that uh, you're not looking at my bedroom too much while I'm looking at the screen, although I'm appreciative of any interior design ideas that anyone, anyone would have. Um, 
again, thanks again. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about the five-year monitoring evaluation and reporting plan that Alberta Environment recently released and uh, it, some of the implications. Specifically, the focus is on uh, West Central Airshed and uh, Alberta Capital Airshed, since I believe this, this webinar primarily reaches out to those stakeholders. However, if you have any questions about other parts of the province, I'm happy to respond to those as well. Uh, I, before I get started, I just wanted to give credit to the people who authored the plan. Uh, in addition to myself, uh, the authors of the plan are Yeni Aklulu, uh, Kristen Adams, uh, Greg Wentworth, and Naomi Tam. And just generally speaking, the, the, uh, we're calling this the MER plan, just in case you hear me saying that. When I say MER plan, it means this uh, plan with this long, long name that we have here. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so the, the, the MER plan, it pr basically provides a road, roadmap for air and deposition monitoring uh, in Alberta that will be led by Alberta Environment and Parks over the next five years. So it basically it's outlining the work that we will be doing as, as Alberta government for the next five years. Uh, very much we acknowledge that we need to work with stakeholders in delivering the plan uh, to be successful. And that's kind of the theme here uh, throughout the presentations. We really need to work with the airsheds and we need to work with stakeholders out, outside of airsheds as well to be successful. Uh, so the, the, the name of the five-year plan is indicated here in this first bullet. I'm assuming you probably can see my mouse uh, on the screen. Um, so it's a long name. So I, I will call it MER plan for short. It was released uh, on October 21st, the day before my birthday, 2021. Uh, contains 37 implementation items uh, that Alberta Environment and Parks will lead uh, in collaboration with stakeholders uh, over the next uh, four to five years now, because we've already started implementation. It is located at this link. Uh, when, I, when you Google it, uh, sometimes it is difficult to find, so you have to put in air quality and deposition monitoring, or if you, uh, I will provide you uh, with the presentation, or I think it might be uploaded to the the websites, the uh, Alberta Capital Airshed and West Central Airshed Society websites where you can access it at that link. Now, also very important is a second document called Supplementary Information Document. And this provides kind of showing our work on the details that we went through in terms of evaluations that were done in, uh, for example, determining where the gaps are in the province of Alberta. So, and, and also in terms of plan implementation, I did mention that we do have 37 implementation items. Uh, we are tracking the status of implementation uh, of those uh, items and we'll be sharing those on an annual basis with stakeholders. Uh, after the plan was released in October, we did uh, share the uh, table on the status of implementation. Uh, I think it was in November, December time period, just uh, before Christmas. If you want to see that status, I can provide that to you. Uh, so just generally speaking, the, the principles behind uh, development and I guess implementation of the of our MER plan are, are indicated here. Uh, collaboration with partners and stakeholders. So that includes uh, airsheds, obviously, airshed organizations. And it also includes uh, other stakeholders such as municipalities, industries, uh, academia, so on and so forth, the NGOs, uh, communities uh, throughout the province of Alberta during implementation. So we see lots of opportunities to do that. Cost-effective and adaptive monitoring. So cost-effective, um, in, in, in the development of our MER plan, we didn't come up with a budget for implementation, but the the idea was that we would have it would be realistic and that we could actually implement it within existing uh, budgets as much as possible. Now I know there there will be new money that is required for some of the implementation, but it's not going to be like uh, you know a multi million dollar uh, implementation. Uh, that's definitely not something we were we were shooting for because quite frankly, that's not realistic um, in this day and age. And again, a realistic path to implementation. We identified uh, 37 implementation items that we thought we could actually do over the next five years, rather than being maybe too maybe uh, uh, visionary and, uh, and kind of jumping beyond what we thought we could do. And also being scientifically sound and credible in how we have developed a plan and how we're planning to implement 
uh, the plan uh, utilizing objective science wherever possible. So I've shown this slide a num number of times, um, but uh, I just wanted to go through it again. Uh, in Alberta, and, and, and you know, we're somewhat unique uh, in, in number, uh, when compared to other jurisdictions, we do have a distributed model for, for air monitoring. Uh, and, and in a lot of other jurisdictions, the monitoring is, is uh, either, either done or led by the government. In Alberta, we have a multi-stakeholder relationship for delivery of air monitoring. Alberta Environment and Parks, we actually only own about 19, maybe 20 air monitoring stations, and we contract the operation of 12 or 13 of those out to airshed organizations. And airshed organizations are, are multi-stakeholder organizations. Of course, my phone's ringing right now. I'll just put it aside. Um, our airsheds are multi-stakeholder organizations and they operate uh, the majority of the monitoring stations in the province. Uh, about 80 of those are operated by airshed organizations. Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, very much involved in delivering the National Air Pollution Surveillance Program across, uh, across the country, and also very much involved in oil sands monitoring program in Northeastern Alberta. And then there's also compliance-based monitoring, and this is primarily monitoring outside of air sheds, and some, some, in some cases inside air sheds as well. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's done directly by the industry. Uh, of who's required to do the monitoring as part of their approval. So the uh, Alberta Environment and Parks, what we try to do is assure consistent data and consistent monitoring throughout the province. The, the rules for monitoring or the specifications or the directions for monitoring are contained within the Air Monitoring Directive and are followed by all of the contributors to this distributed model. We also have an audit program that's, that's, that's done by Alberta Environment and Parks where we audit the air monitoring stations that are part of this, uh, this distributed network, uh, at least on an annual basis, although that did, was, was slowed down during the pandemic. And also we provide data from all of the monitoring in this network uh, as publicly available through the Air Quality Health Index, especially in communities. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later and also through the air data warehouse where that contains quality controlled data that's uploaded on a monthly basis. So the plan basically that we've developed ha has a, a provincial uh, lens uh, looking at the whole entire province of Alberta. It looks at uh, developing monitoring objectives for different types of monitoring within Alberta, uh, adaptive monitoring. So of being able to change monitoring approaches where it makes sense to do so, and also including changing technologies. And we'll talk a little bit more about this and Kevin will talk a little bit more about this in his presentation. Uh, so the highlights of what we are working to working towards, and when I say we, it, it really is our environment in collaboration with our, with our partners, such as our shared organizations. Uh, we're looking at effective reporting on condition of the environment and, um, we recently uh, put condition of the environment reporting on our website. Uh, I think that was released on January 26, where we do have air indicators now on our showing the status and trends of air quality on Alberta Environment and Parks website. Uh, implementation of future Canadian Abbey air quality standards or CAKES. And I understand this was discussed at the previous uh, webinar. And uh, as we all likely know, the national standards or CAKES are becoming more stringent in the future. And uh, we, have, we have more parameters included such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter and ozone. Uh, so these are something that uh, in Alberta, in many locations we're running into the standards and in some cases getting almost exceeding these standards, which is uh, quite important. Uh, in, in terms of working in partners, um, uh, partnership with airsheds, we're, we're looking really focusing on fewer monitoring gaps. Uh, so addressing some of the gaps that we've identified and also use of different kind of monitoring, non-traditional monitoring uh, equipment. So we've been looking at uh, testing and utilizing low cost air quality sensors and uh, many airsheds have been doing the same thing. 
So we're looking at coordinating our implementation of these types of sensors. Uh, we've also, uh, in our monitoring plan, we're looking at modernizing the deposition monitoring network that's operated by the province of Alberta, making it consistent with international standards and also improving our understanding and also addressing emerging air issues. And, uh, and obviously, the I think the one that's on most people's minds is wildfire smoke and the increase in the occurrence of wildfire smoke uh, in Western Canada. And again, success, the, the general theme throughout is success is dependent upon effective collaboration with our partners, airshed organizations. So starting uh, to show you a little bit about what we've done within our, our MER plan. Um, we are, we are, uh, uh, we did look at all the monitoring stations that report data to the air data warehouse. And um, we, we did, went through process, a process where we did an objective analysis using a geospatial uh, analysis to try to uh, 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 to, to classify each of these monitoring stations and then start determining what the monitoring objectives are for the, for the stations. So I won't go through that in detail, but uh, there is a map in the plan and there's also a list of the monitoring stations in the plan and that shows how this classification uh, worked. Um, it, it was uh, very much an objective criteria that were used to do the classification of the monitoring stations. And then after we applied the objective criteria, we did send this out to the airsheds for their input and we made changes to the classifications uh, where they said, you know, based on what you've done, you know, this isn't quite right. Uh, we think the station should be classified as a community station instead of an in, uh, uh, industry compliance station or, or something along those lines or a near industrial facility station. So we, we made those kinds of changes uh, in consultation with airsheds. And I, I should also mention that the MER plan uh, did receive lots of comments from stakeholders and the scientific community in Alberta and also outside of Alberta that we did incorporate. Um, so what we're going to focus on next are gaps in regional and community monitoring. And I wanted to focus on um, West Central Airshed uh, and also the Alberta Capital Airshed. Uh, one of the primary indicators that we use for um, reporting air quality in communities is the air quality health index. And I'm not going to assume everybody knows what it is. So on the next slide, I'll, I'll describe a little bit what it is. It's called the AQHI. So the air quality health index it is, uh, is like an index, like a, there's a number of financial indexes out there that, that include different parameters to, to, to make it work. It, it works on a scale of one to 10, and it takes data that's, uh, that's reported continuously to our traditional monitoring stations uh, located throughout the province. Uh, one's operated by Alberta Environment and Parks and one's operated by the airshed organizations. The intent of the tool is that it um, provides information to, to Albertans and, and with the public around Canada. It's used across Canada. Uh, to understand what air quality means to their health and also manage their exposure to air pollution. Um, in developing of the index, uh, it, it was understood that uh, different individuals have different sensitivities to, to air pollution. So if the individual knows that they are sensitive to air quality levels, say in the moderate risk category, they can adjust their behaviors based on that. However, others may be less sensitive and say maybe it's in the, when it's in a high risk category, when we get the, the wildfire smoke situations, that's when they adjust their activities. And others may be very sensitive and adjust their activities, you know, around a three to four area. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that yet. Um, so, and as I mentioned, uh, the index uses concentrations of particulate matter, ozone and nitrogen dioxide. And it's a, it's a formula that looks at concentrations of, of those three as a three hour average. Uh, and the reason these pollutants are selected is because they're known to have uh, impacts on human health at, certain, at various levels. Now, in addition to these pollutants, this uh, formulation was developed by the federal government, by Health Canada. 
Uh, in addition to that, Albert Environment and Parks has also added sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide to the index uh, because of our uh, strong energy in, in industry in the province. And in addition, we um, also have a, a, a mechanism where we actually will trump the index uh, when there's wildfire smoke situations. Um, parts of Eastern Canada don't get the type of wildfire smoke situations that we get in, in British Columbia and Alberta. So we, the index has to be more reactive when we do have wildfire smoke situations. So if we see elevated particulate matter levels, which is a primary component of wildfire smoke over a certain trigger, then we automatically uh, make the air quality index go into the high risk category. And that way it's more, um, more reactive to what we're actually seeing on the ground. So the air quality health index is reported in 35 communities across the province, uh, 35 communities and about, um, I'm just thinking about 75 or 80 stations. Uh, the communities in the West Central Airshed are Drayton Valley, Hinton and Edson, where the AQHI is available. And the communities in the Alberta Capital Airshed are Edmonton, uh, St. Albert and Strathcona, Strathcona County or Sherwood Park our Drossen area. So those are the communities where we have to AQHI right now in within the, the West Central Airshed and also the Alberta Capital Airshed. Now there is a number of communities where we don't have the AQHI available. And I think those are the ones we need to focus on. And data is available uh, on the AQHI from Alberta Environment's website where we have a nice map to look at and from the, the various airshed websites as well. And then there's also an app that you can download to your iPhone or Android phone, uh, which, which provides you the air quality health index. And it also provides you push notifications if numbers are higher than a certain value. Uh, one thing I did want to note is the current national air quality health index app. Uh, for those of you who are using it right now, it's currently changing to an app that has been developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, under called the Weather Can app. So in the future, uh, starting in, um, I'm not sure exactly the time frame right now, starting in the April time frame, April, May, June time frame, so or this spring, uh, that the app that currently exists will be de decommissioned and will replace be replaced by the Weather Can app. Uh, and so the users of the current app will be required to go and download the new app to get your air quality health index information. And there will be messages associated with the old app telling you to do so and telling you how to do so. Uh, so now I want to focus a little bit on Alberta Capital Airshed and the West Central Airshed Society. So as I uh, as I mentioned before, I think I mentioned it, maybe I didn't quite mention it, is we did go through a process where we did a GIS analysis and we looked at all the uh, communities in the province of Alberta that do not have air monitoring at the present time. And we did a, a ranking uh, based on population, based on location to the nearest air monitoring station and based on uh, local emission sources and a bunch of other factors to, to, to rank the, the stations where we think uh, based on this objective analysis, um, uh, there's uh, the greatest need for air quality health index or community monitoring. So the, the top 10 communities, it's always good to have a top 10 in the West Central and Alberta Capital Airshed area are listed here. Uh, Camrose, White Court, uh, Leduc, Spruce Grove, Beaumont, Morinville, Pinocchio, Devon, uh, Wetaskiwin and Stony Plake. Uh, Stony Plain, sorry. I'm just double checking to make sure Panoka is in, um, it's in this airshed, sorry. I hope it is, maybe it's not. I could have, I could have made a mistake there, which is not the first time. Um, so anyway, the, the, what we do want to do is we want to work with airsheds on how to fill these gaps in, in air monitoring. Uh, and there's a number of things that we can actually do, which we will focus, look at on the next slides. So working with partners to address these gaps. Uh, one thing that we do plan to do, and it's you know maybe not a huge thing, but we, Alberta Environment does have a portable air monitoring laboratory that we want to uh, lend out uh, to an airshed for one or two year time period to, to be operated in one of the communities 
Uh, and again, this is across Alberta, one of the communities that does not have air monitoring right now and then report to air quality health index. So what we're looking at is uh, developing a, a, a request for proposals that will be provided to all the airsheds. And the ones that are interested can provide us with a proposal on where they would like to utilize this uh, portable air monitoring laboratory to fill, fill the gaps. And, uh, and we're looking at uh, providing funding for that. Other things that we're doing is we're, we're uh, doing ongoing instrument loans to, to air sheds. So for example, if there is a monitoring station, perhaps it's operated by an industry within a community that operates, uh, that collects parameters like sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, because that's what's important for that particular industry. Uh, we, are, we would be interested in loaning the uh, the airshed or the industry uh, monitoring equipment that's necessary to report to air quality health index such as particulate matter monitoring instruments such as ozone monitoring and such as nitrogen dioxide uh, monitoring so that you can actually calculate the air quality health index at that particular station and then we could have that data available uh, to the public i'm also very much working with uh, partners, and I think this is a very important part of it, is using low cost air quality sensors to monitor air quality. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next few slides. So air quality sensors, and these are low cost air quality sensors. We're looking at sensors that are between $500 and $5,000 a piece compared to a traditional monitoring station, which costs about a quarter of a million dollars capital cost and about $100,000 a year to operate. So we're looking at very much uh, lower cost sensors than, than traditional monitors. However, it's important um, to understand that when you do go with these low cost sensors, the data is not of the same quality that you get when you go with the traditional monitors. However, with the new sensors that have come out with the new technology over the last five or 10 years, they do seem to be providing good air quality data and it can be used for certain purposes. So as an example, uh, we've been working with a, a sensor that's been used in citizen science monitoring programs called the purple air sensor. So this sensor monitors for one pollutant and monitors for particulate matter. And particulate matter is a main component of wildfire smoke. So if we're able to get concentrations of particulate matter, it really gives us a good, good idea whether a community is being impacted by wildfire smoke. This is really important in Western Alberta where a lot of smaller communities don't have any monitoring at all. And they're some of the first communities who are impacted by wildfire smoke. So what Alberta Environments and Parks has done is we have done a evaluation of monitoring across, sorry, evaluation of communities across the province that are most susceptible to being impacted by wildfire smoke. And we've working with a number of partners, including airsheds, including Environment and Climate Change Canada, who's providing a lot of these sensors, including Indigenous Services Canada, Alberta Health, uh, airsheds, I said already, and then uh, various other groups who are very excited about these projects and implementing these sensors in communities, working with the communities to do it. And these are sensors that can actually be implemented by individuals. It's, it's not super difficult. However, if individuals do, you know, do you want some help in implementing these airsheds have been providing that, that kind of help. Now, in addition to just monitoring the air quality, and getting concentrations of individual pollutants. I'm just looking at the time. It looks like I'm running a little bit late here. Um, we are also looking at airsheds as, as uh, being very important for community engagement and education. And I think that's one, one area where airsheds really shine. Uh, in addition, uh, so we're, we're look, currently looking at evaluation of these air quality sensors for community. Oh, sorry, I, I changed my thoughts here. So one thing we are doing is working with these purple air citizen sciences monitors. And the second thing we are doing is evaluation of air other air quality sensors for community implementation to uh, for air quality health index. So these are different kinds of sensor 
uh, that measure multiple pollutants such as particulate matter, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide, and it can actually report to Air Quality Health Index. We've had good uh, success with these sensors based on a pilot study that we've done, uh, where we it looks like this small sensor, which is about five thousand dollars, can provide fairly good information to report to Air Quality Health Index and perhaps complement the traditional monitoring that is undertaken throughout the province. So our pilots, uh, we're, what we're doing right now is we're working with the Alberta Capital Airshed to find a location uh, to, to further test one of these sensors. And then if our pilot is successful, we'll consider, well, we'll look at further deployment throughout the province, which I'm really looking, looking forward to. I do realize I'm going long here, so I'm trying to speed up a little bit. I'm almost done. Uh, so in addition, other items that we're doing in, in implementing our monitoring evaluation and reporting plan, continue to report against the, Can the Canadian ambient air quality standards and the more strict stringent standards. Um, the uh, release of the air quality indicators on the condition of the environment website, which was on January 26, 2022, provide information with air quality health index information and hopefully adding these low cost air quality sensors to that system in sometime two, three years down the road. And we also conduct short term focus studies to address local air quality issues and concerns and we're always re ready for emergencies. And you can see our, our mobile air monitoring laboratory here. So last slide here, working with partners, uh, just focusing on uh, lending, we, uh, lending uh, uh, our portable air monitoring uh, uh, laboratory to an air shed for a 12 to 24 month time period, uh, aligning deployment of our purple air citizen monitors for monitoring for wildfire smoke with the air shed deployments of these monitors. And then also conducting an evaluation of the air quality sensors for community implementation of the air quality health index. So we are planning to do, uh, to work with air sheds on these items. So I think that's it for me. And uh, I don't know, I think we're, we're doing questions later or now, I can't remember. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And um, what we'll do is um, I want to thank you for that, that presentation. I have a whole list of questions myself, and I saw a few more pop up in the in the Q&A section. So that's great. Um, I'll just take a moment here to do, um, you know, to provide a little bit of information about an airship for anybody who may not be familiar with that. We'll head to Kevin's presentation and then we will do uh, all the Q and A's together. So um, just as a little reminder for anyone who's not familiar with what this whole airshed thing is that we're talking about, airsheds are multi-stakeholder nonprofit organizations that monitor air quality. So we collect the data and report on that data to the public as well as government, which you heard all about. Um, and I think one of the things that really comes through very strongly in Bob's presentation is this idea of collaboration, right? And, and this opportunity for collaboration between Alberta Environment and Parks and airsheds, airsheds working with community, um, with industry, with municipalities. And we see that in that, that pilot that Bob referenced in um, the ability to give feedback on the initiatives that AEP is doing um, in the use of some of this non-traditional air quality uh, equipment, such as the purple airs. Um, uh, you know, I'll draw your attention if you do go to the Westcats website, right on our homepage, we've got a link to a program that we're doing to deploy purple air monitors throughout the region. And if you are interested in that, you can shoot me an email, jcusick at wcas.ca or, um, you know, head to the form there on the website. We have some purple airs in, uh, you know, Jasper and Marathorpe and a whole bunch of other places as a, as a result of that. And we're always happy to, uh, you know, take further requests and, and, you know, to fill those monitoring gaps that, um, you know, Bob was talking about. I'll also draw your attention, wildfire smoke was brought up a couple of times. Last June, June 2021, Alberta Capital Air Shed also held uh, another webinar all about wildfire smoke, and it um, focused on the, you know, what's happening to forests um, and why this is happening on the human health impact, as well as what's happening in, in the data and what we can expect from there. If you'd like to see a recording of that, again, you can head to the Capital Air Shed website. So with all of that, 
I would like to welcome back Kevin to the screen. Thanks, Kevin. I see you've already turned on your camera. Kevin is a senior environmental engineer and the data manager for West Central Airshed and Alberta Captain Airshed. Kevin holds a PhD and Master of Science in Environmental Engineering from the U of A with specialties in ambient air quality and river water quality. Um, he's worked for much of his career in the air monitoring field, working with air zones throughout Western Canada, focusing on air quality data analysis and interpretation, monitoring instrumentation, as well as dispersion and transport modeling. I could go on and on about Kevin, um, but I think what you'd rather do is hear from Kevin himself. Um, Kevin's presentation will focus on, uh, you know, what airsheds are doing to fill the gaps in air quality monitoring. So with that, welcome Kevin. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks, Bob, for the presentation. So I'm going to try and tag on to some of the information that you presented and uh, hopefully this will will go at a at a decent rate. I'm not going to try and go over, uh, but uh, we have a few slides to get over. I'm not going to give you the pathway other than I'm going to just do this one to you. Um, this is what my students typically tell me that when I'm trying to give them a lecture in a hurry, they're trying to drink from the fire hose and I'm not meaning to do that but I do want to present a handful of information and some interesting information for everyone as well. Where we can imagine for all of the air quality aspects, uh, there are several pathways, several uh, pieces of the puzzle as we're trying to put together. But we're, right now, we're going to try and focus just on the monitoring of the ambient air. So just on the one side of this whole pathway. So the question is, why do we even want to monitor it? And this is taken right from uh, some of the historical document that Alberta Environment and Parks has put together. And part of it is that they want to ensure that pollution control techno technologies are actually operating efficiently. They want to give that early warning for the community, uh, for people in general, and uh, give the companies the heads up that they're having uh, issues as well. They want to be able to assess some of the impacts and provide data for trending. And that's one of the things that we'll really look at a lot is look at the long-term trending and the environmental effects uh, that we see going forward. And where we see it coming forward, and, and Bob definitely mentioned this one, was where things are gonna end up. Uh, the World Health Organization has put some more information together. And some of the uh, aspects that they've talked about is that uh, a quote that they had there that almost 99% of the global population are exposed to air pollution levels that put them at increased risk. So doing so, we're going to start to see a drive to lower some of the air quality uh, uh, indexes, and they're going to go further, more stringent. And, and it's just going to be a natural procedure as we start to move forward. The, uh, the question about uh, was raised, and when we were talking about this presentation is, what is the Alberta Airshed model? And in, in a nutshell, one of the things that we look at is the Airshed model was really built from a grassroots up. So often it came from issues that had happened in an area. Uh, they're often in populated areas and there were some, some missing components of it. Uh, industry doing monitoring, government doing monitoring and they wanted, uh, the public wanted a, a place at the table. So they formed this multi-stakeholder not-for-profit organizations that came forward and that was the air sheds uh, as, we, as we move forward in time. Um, one of the things that we look at is trying to provide that forum for regional stakeholders to raise issues, uh, talk amongst ourselves, improve the data availab availability and transparency, uh, provide some of the publicly focused information, and really doing some of the knowledge transfer. Uh, so this is at all different levels, from uh, schools all the way through uh, up to community groups. And then also leveraging some of the funding from industry and stakeholders so that we, we often will talk about a polluter pays principle that um, as you have emissions, they pay for some of the monitoring or portion of the monitoring going forward. The other pieces kind of snaps it all together is that we wanna make sure that there's real-time monitoring available, that there's uh, monthly reports for people to be able to see and scientific review of some of the data. Um, and this could be in conjunction with academia, this could be in conjunction with government, or it could be in conjunction with industry themselves. But getting that scientific review of the data is important as well. Some of the airshed uh, social media webinars, forums, uh, as Julie had mentioned, we definitely are, are reaching out that way. We have the annual reports that are put forward. The education and outreach is always fun. Um, 
putting the professor hat on, I often enjoy being able to talk to school groups and uh, getting into the classrooms to actually show them some of the, the tools that we'll use, some of the small micro samplers and so forth. We have the air quality health index, of course, on the app, and Bob had mentioned that. And then some of the, going, taking a step back and looking at some of the historical monitoring and showing whether we're improving or, or not. The grassroots side of things, and I, I alluded to this one, was some of it uh, came from issues that had happened in the past. Uh, so there was trust issues. So industry was questioned, are they doing the right thing? Um, is government being transparent with the data? Is the monitoring in the right place for the right parameters as we see it? And then ultimately, where were the, uh, the voice of the people that were being exposed? And that was part of it going forward. So it was really the strive to be independent, a scientific non-government organization to represent uh, all stakeholders. And right at this point, we have 10 airsheds in Alberta, 87 monitoring stations, and many more uh, passives or micro samplers, the purple air, uh, for example, that Bob had talked about. The, all of the airsheds form under the Alberta Airshed Council. So we can go to their website and get more information for each of the airsheds. And one of the things that I just picked on that one was under the resources is that you can see that often uh, where the piece that people will look for is some of the education materials. Um, some of the information that is available to schools, to some of the groups to, to get more information about the air quality and the regional effect as well. So we see from here just the, the air quality air sheds on the left hand side, uh, all of the air sheds in the area. And I just simply put a map on the right hand side saying that if we were to just look at all the locations where people are, and this is the people greater than 500 in, in the small census areas, um, we overlay that with all of our monitoring and including our, our purple air monitoring that we have in several areas. Um, then we overlay that with all of the monitoring or emission sources. So we start to look at it and go, are we monitoring in the right locations at the right places? And that's what Murr really was looking at uh, as well, making sure that we've got these communities covered and going forward um, to cover some of these gaps. So Bob talked about the continuous air monitoring stations. They're, they're large, they're um, expensive to run. Uh, so one of the things was saying, uh, what do we do with some of these monitoring stations? And if you look in the great details of some of these stations, uh, every one of the airsheds um, follow the air monitoring directive. So the AMD is, as uh, Bob had, had talked about, so that this makes sure that all data that we have is is held to that high scientific standard and high data quality so that it can be used and trusted to go forward with. The continuous monitoring is a plethora of, of information that's there and it could be anywhere from the, the sulfur dioxide, the nitrogen dioxides like are common to the more, uh, more interesting, the VOCs, like we could have BTEC, speciated VOCs, uh, particulate matter, speciated particulate matter, there's a whole host of uh, information that's being collected and a lot of information. If you've ever been to the data warehouse to try and pull information down, there's lots of uh, information there. There's uh, also the, the passive uh, ability so that we can collect things remotely from areas that are um, non-electric. Uh, non it's just a passive sampler, but it often collects over a month, month time frame or a month exposure. So we can collect some of these other samplers or integrated samplers. So over a NAP schedule, the National Air Pollution Surveillance Schedule, every six days, every three days um, to try and collect a, a more robust 24 hour sample. So with all of this sampling that's out there, that's why one of the things that we also looked at was these small samplers, the continuous samplers. And I'm just gonna flip through a couple of my, just conscious of the time. Um, one of the things that we'll do is we'll take a look at all of the data that we have to start to get some sense of trends over um, an extended period. Are we seeing improvements? Uh, specifically, uh, Edmonton Central is now closed. The station is, is, uh, has been moved. But uh, we saw that over a long period of sampling from 1982 to the end of 2020, that we were seeing a distinct uh, reduction in emissions uh, that it was being picked up. And so these are good news stories that we wanna make sure that we see. Another station that I like to look at is uh, Carrot Creek in West Central, because one of the things that we'll look at is the SO2, the long-term trending of SO2. So this is again, a station from 1998 to present, uh, still operating. And we're looking at the reductions that we've seen in SO2 over the time frame, And really that's primarily due to the regulatory um, that's been put forward 
to reduce emissions. But having been able to take all this data from our airsheds, we can now draw it into larger data sets and start to do some comparisons to say, um, just within the regions, are we seeing things that are improving, um, but also being able to do some national comparisons as well. So that's back to our cakes to see how uh, each of the regions are, are, are holding out. But when we see there's still lots of gaps in here, we now are turning to some of these smaller and more unique samplers. Uh, Bob had talked about some of the, some of the work that's, that AEP has done for the air quality, like the AQY, um, the purple airs, of course, and all of the information that's out there for these ones. Uh, US EPA has done tons of work as well. Um, their sensor toolbox is uh, linked to it, uh, where they've tested tons of different small samplers as well, and being able to put that out to say uh, pretty much if these samplers are good, bad, or otherwise, but all, also being able, to, being able to test these ones. The big reason for some of these new emerging sensors is to look at being able to fill gaps. Um, really the, the ease of use, small size, the cost, even just the, the inexpensive side of it, being able to fill in those gaps with these smaller samplers is, is beneficial. And we also wanna be able to look at some of the, uh, the high resolution capabilities of them. So can it collect data in sub, uh, sub minute or five, less than five minute increments to allow for a quick review, being able to get back to that uh, warning. So the wildfire smoke, for example, and the AQHI plus from the particulate to see if it can go forward. The, uh, then moving even forward, Further, we've got some of the remote sensing and the artificial intelligence that clicks into that one. So some of the satellite data that we're looking at now is coming across hourly and marrying that now with the QHI or marrying it with the AI to so artificial intelligence, we can start to see some of the forecasts. So this is just an example of the purple air that we have in one community in Camrose, uh, one, of the, one of the locations that's uh, on the list that needs, that's uh, considered a gap, uh, gap uh, location. Um, but making sure that we're adhering to uh, Environment Canada's and Alberta Environment's um, uh, requirements for some, for some of these uh, stations. Uh, right now, ECCC has been working with uh, UNBC to prepare uh, an algorithm to correct the uh, purple airs. So we make sure that we uh, keep changing the algorithm to match what's, uh, what's being done nationally to, to keep it out there. If we keep going into the remote sensing side of things now, this is where we start to see some of the interesting and fun stuff. Uh, I know I don't have a lot of time, but it's always fun to be able to look at um, certain locations like um, say the Null School is always a fun one to see um, because it's one of those ones that if we look at it, we can see real time what the weather patterns are and we can click on anywhere on the planet to get uh, an indication. We can also change the the conditions of it to, uh, to look at different pollutants, not just wind speed and wind direction as well. So with, with some of the other uh, data that's out there, like the NASA Earth data, we can get the air quality data real time uh, for certain locations, um, or should I say by hour for some of the flybys, as long as we have, uh, we're on the flight path of the instruments that are going through including uh, the Copernicus. Um, so definitely with Sentinel-5 that went through, the information that it's looking at is the greenhouse gases, the ozone um, and different aerosols and different reactive gases. So this is where we're gonna see our SO2 or NO2, um, methane and certain other aspects that we can see from space. When we now take some of that data, we're looking at it now uh, going even further to say, where do we see some of the forecasts? So one of the pieces is the wildfire forecasts uh, that we all use for uh, like the blue sky. Uh, we'll use these kind of forecasts. This is from uh, married with some of the NOAA and high split. Uh, so it's a Lagrangian particle models. And it gives us the ability to look at um, some of the particulate moving forward from the smoke. Um, and it gives us that forecast. So we can see it ahead of time. Um, one caution that we often have is that we've got uh, indexes out there like the World's Air Pollution Index, and now we've got two of the newer ones where the Plume Monitor, and the, uh, which is uh, now gone in with AccuWeather, and the Apple Weather app with Breezometer. Those ones uh, will each have their different air quality health index. They do tend to have options to pick an AQHI, the Canadian AQHI, but some of them report different air quality indexes, so we have to be a little cautious. Um, that we're comparing apples and apples as we move forward. Uh, the one that came forward is it was at a community meeting that we had with the uh, ACA 
and uh, Breeze meter was raised uh, to the, the community, community meeting. So we dug into it a little bit further just to see if there was information. So I just picked uh, yesterday's date when I was looking at it and to see from the Edmonton region where, where we're seeing um, the air quality in particular. And this was uh, at a certain time of the day yesterday when I, when I picked it. And then during rush hour, we see a different about picture. And so this is all forecast using uh, artificial intelligence, different data streams, including satellite, including our ground sensors and marrying it together in order to get some uh, ground level um, near, nearby readings so that people would be able to look at it. In particular, uh, I, I just clued in on Twilio Drive and you can see that there was a difference between uh, a moderate health risk and, and, uh, and slightly off that. Again, this is all forecast data that we, we use to go forward, but it is an interest to see how, uh, how far they've moved in some of, these, some of these areas. And we're still in talks with them to see. Um, just wrapping up, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about uh, to go forward with some of the airsheds was working with our stakeholders. And right at the very top, the education and interaction was the most important because then that gives everybody the ability to talk and understand where the concerns are because that's where we're really gonna understand it. And then open information, um, we can actually have that uh, uh, to lessen some of the public fears that are out there. And really then engaging the public is an invested interest for everybody because then we understand where the concerns are, what's happening, and it'll give us a better relationship to go forward. So Bob mentioned uh, the citizen science or community-based monitoring. There's lots of tools out there and lots of work being done in, in all over the world. Um, so the European Union has got uh, guidelines for some of this for assessing it through citizen science. Uh, US EPA has got all sorts of uh, documents as well. Um, I, I just wish they would use the different acronym because it just looks like scam. I don't know why, but... And even uh, like ECCC, we work closely with them with some of the purple layer work as well. Uh, so there's lots of information out there, especially on the citizen science or community monitoring. And we wanna make sure that we're using, um, using some of this to, to go forward to fill some of our gaps. So really just to wrap it up, uh, one of the things that we're knowing is that the, some of these new monitoring techniques are gonna get faster and more accessible. And it's gonna be our data that's really one of the big hurdles that we see is that we wanna be able to serve the information to everyone in a quick manner that's meaningful to everybody to at least give everyone a heads up to see what's happening. And we know this is a growing concern. Just uh, I grabbed some from uh, Yahoo Finance. We're saying that uh, it's, it's building for the amount of information that's needed and the amount of dollar figures that's going out there. The last thing I kind of had there as a nice joke uh, was one of the advantages of the microsensors is we don't tend to have spiders crawl inside a microsensor. Uh, I've yet to find too many nano spiders, but uh, this is one of the things that we've run into in the past and it's run, uh, definitely run into some havoc in different times. So I hope that wasn't too quick for everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. And uh, if these pre presentations will be out, going out to everyone, I threw in just some additional links at the end as well. So Bob had some of these, some of the links as well. I just wanted to make sure everybody had them. So it'll be kind of duplicated. Wonderful. Thank you for that, uh, that presentation, Kevin. It, it was speedy, but it was like rapid fire, all this like great information coming at us all at once. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we've got about five minutes left in today's webinar. So I'm gonna keep our questions pretty uh, tight. There was one question that came around the air quality health index adjustments. So this comes, this question I think touches on both of the presentations. One was around, um, you know, the adjustments um, regarding wildfire smoke and that PM 2.5. So that one's maybe a bit more to Bob. And then we've got this other question around AQHI adjustments and this, um, you know, Kevin, when you went to go look at Twilliger Drive and those forecasts versus what the air quality health index actually was. So let's dive into air quality health index as our one and only question of the day. Let's go Bob and then we'll go Kevin. Yeah, so yeah, in terms of the air quality health index I mentioned, it is based on three parameters uh, primarily uh, across Canada, nitrogen, dioxide, ozone, and particulate matter. And particulate matter is the one that's most indicative of wildfire smoke. Uh, and, and I also mentioned, maybe didn't mention it very clearly, but the index is based on a three hour average 
the one that was developed across Canada. So what that means is if, if you get an immediate situation such as wildfire smoke uh, coming into a community, the index, the way it was formula formulated, would not uh, respond to that uh, incident until two or three hours later. And that was not acceptable. So what we did here in Alberta is we utilized, we use our air quality uh, guideline for particulate matter where we actually override the uh, air quality health index when our ambient air quality guideline is exceeded. So it goes up to a high risk. And we found that has been very successful in, uh, in, in when you're comparing it uh, air quality that you're seeing with the index to what's actually on the ground. And we, we did that when the index was first incorporated back in 2012. So it's not a new thing for us. So it's been about 10 years. Wonderful. Thanks for that ex explanation, uh, Bob. Okay, over to you, Kevin, on, on that forecasting bit and these little, you know, devices on our phones versus, you know, what else AQHI is telling us. Well, and, and Andrew put a, a good comment in there saying that it's always better to look local than to see some of these global indexes. And it's true, but one of the things that we're seeing is the, the movement of this is moving quite rapidly. And one of the things in talking with these groups, they're, they're sifting through terabytes of data. Um, almost on an hourly basis based on all the different forecast streams. So it's interesting to see, but I will say one thing that we ran into at one point is that uh, we had uh, a technician doing a calibration at one of the West Central stations and they did not put it into calibration mode right away. So all of a sudden we got a huge AQHI spike and the alarm went out instantly to everybody. So it was a, a tweeted out and we ended up uh, having to retract everything because it, it wasn't real. Like we had to make sure that everyone was understanding that the alarm wasn't real. So it kind of catches us twofold. We want the data out as fast as possible, but we also end up getting caught sometimes that um, to try and retract some of that. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, we actually have 60 seconds left and we have one more Q&A that just came in and I really want to get in as many as we can. So here it is, rapid fire. Um, any research and development to PM10 as we learn more about the impact? So like 30 second answer, each of you go. Uh, for, from my perspective, yes, uh, PM10 is becoming more important from a hu human health perspective. I do see the technology is available to, to actually measure PM10 as well as PM2.5, so the larger particles. So that's definitely something we can incorporate into our program in the future. And, and some of the monitors that I know we've worked with, uh, both Bob and myself, is that we'll not only look at the PM10 and PM2.5, but we'd rather look at the spe uh, spectrum. So right from the PM0.5, PM1, PM2.5, PM5, PM10. So you have the whole spectrum that you can look at. Wonderful. Thanks for that. So with that, that is a wrap for today's webinar. I want to thank everyone again for who participated and to let you know that we'll be sending out a short feedback survey. And I would certainly like to thank our presenters. There was so much great information presented today. I learned a lot. I, I'm thinking that the, the folks who participated also learned a lot. So um, thank you for, for that. And um, just a heads up to everyone, um, we have had a few people reach out to me since um, we aired our first Clean Air webinar, um, asking how can we find out more? When are, when are the next ones? What are the next topics? I would say, you know, please stay tuned to your inboxes when you sign up for that newsletter and our social media cha channels. We will be sending out information on April's webinar in the next few days, sometime next week. And so, Stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, have a great day, everyone. Thanks Thank so much. You.